Thank you, Sushil. It's uh, truly an honor and privilege to be here today to address such an august audience. And, uh, you know, when I think back to the early days of Augustia, which I and a number of other people started, couldn't have imagined that one day people at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore would be interested in knowing about our story. So once again, I'm very honored and thank you for your time. In uh, January 1882, Van Gogh, the uh, great post-impressionist uh, painter, in a letter to his brother Theo wrote, drawing becomes more and more a passion with me and it is a passion just like that of a sailor for the sea. Van Gogh's art represented painting as music. Those are not just flowers in a vase. They're almost something cosmic, said a critic about the sunflowers, one of Van Gogh's greatest paintings. So unlocking the creative potential of children, adults, and communities around the world, poor, rich, and downtrodden, is, I believe, one of the most important challenges of the 21st century. By the end of my speech, you should learn about the transformative power of curiosity and uh, see new ways of unlocking and unleashing your own creativity. So what makes you creative or innovative or a great problem solver? Is it something in your genes or a skill that you've learned over the years? In 1884, when Einstein was five years old, his father brought him a gift, a magnetic compass. The compass fascinated Einstein because whichever way he held it, it always pointed in the same direction. It was a momentous gift. Einstein remarked years later that it was the compass that made him wonder if there was an invisible force in the universe behind everything that happened in the universe. Now, I know what you're thinking. Do I have to be Einstein to be creative? So let's fast forward more than a century later to 2008 on a hot summer's day in rural India, a place called Kuppam, not very far from where we are today, two village girls, Rani and Roja, one the daughter of a farmer and the other the daughter of a carpenter, sat under a tree to escape the sun. Sensible thing to do in the Indian summer, right? And the girls began to talk and Rani looked at Roja and said, you know Roja, do you ever wonder why you feel cool or cooler sitting in the shade of a tree? And Roja thought for a second, hmm, well, maybe it has something to do with the fact that the leaves and branches of the tree shield us from the sun. And the girls continued talking some more until the aha question popped out. Would different leaves have different cooling effects? And that question became a project not surprisingly titled The Cooling Effect of Leaves. And working with uh, instructors from the Augustia Foundation, Nine months later, the girls won a prestigious Intel Iris National Science Award, competing with the best and brightest kids from across India, most of them from relatively well-heeled urban schools. Now, is the story of Rani and Roja an uncommon one? So let's go to North Karnataka. Sai and Pavitra, two rather poor children, used to go home to their village on their annual vacation, and they would see these mountains of groundnut shells piled up. As you know, India is one of the largest producers of groundnuts in the world. And they found it rather disturbing, you know, aesthetically not very pleasing. So they asked the question, can we make something useful out of these groundnut shells? So they went to their chemistry teacher and uh, mixed a lot of different compounds with the groundnut shells to create a paste. And that was the good news from which they would make paper. The bad news is, paste wouldn't hold together. It wasn't gluey enough. So the paper became very brittle. So they hit a brick wall. And Sai went home, rather disheartened, but still very curious. And he was observing his grandmother cooking his favorite dish, lady's finger. And he noticed something. He found that it left behind a gluey residue. And that was his aha moment. And he thought, maybe I can use this to provide the glue to keep that paste together. And sure enough, it did and they produced paper. Now, I wasn't even aware of this, although they'd been working with the Augustia instructors, until I saw a film about them on the internet 
made by the Deshpande Foundation one of our supporters. And so did an entrepreneur involved in the groundnut business. So he came up to us and said, hey, I'd like to know the formula because, you know, maybe I can commercialize this. But that's a different story. And uh, we don't have time to go into that, but some other day. Since 2008, when Rani and Roja met and sat under that tree, hundreds of children have done fascinating projects that have produced really interesting and innovative insights and findings. And many of them have won awards and prizes in India and at the international level. So what do these stories tell you? I think they tell you the value of curiosity, the spirit of inquiry, the magic of wonder, the power of passion, staying with a problem until you've cracked it. Keynes wrote about Newton, that Newton's peculiar gift was his continuous concentrated introspection, his capacity to hold a problem in his mind continuously for weeks on end until he saw through it. You know, the rishis of old in India had tremendous mental energy. They would hold problems and ideas in their minds, not just for weeks, but months and even decades. In 1988, I was a banker living in New York. I happened to see a film called The Man Who Loved Numbers. It was about the mathematical genius Ramanujan. And I was fascinated and particularly moved by Janaki Ammal, Mrs. Ramanujan's wife, and her comments on her husband. A few weeks later, I went to Madras. I happened to mention the film to my uncle. And to my great surprise and delight, he said, would you like to meet Mrs. Ramanujan? I couldn't believe it. I said, sure. So about an hour later, I was led into this very modest living room in Triplicane in Madras and was immediately drawn to a magnificent bust of Ramanujan's that had been made by an American sculptor, and I understand funded by 100 mathematicians from around the world, that dominated the room. As we chatted, Mrs. Ramanujan, who was then 89 and hard of hearing, said in a very high-pitched voice, eyes full of tears, no one remembers my husband anymore. You're the first person to come and see me in the last two years. The person before me was a math teacher, Punjabi lady from England, and she described Ramanujan's last days and said on his deathbed were pieces of paper strewn around with abstract mathematical formulae. And then she added with a sense of wonder, for him it was just numbers, numbers, and numbers. So for those of you who understand Tamil, she said, kanak, kanak, kanak. Ramanujan's was an example, an astounding example, perhaps an extreme one of passion-based creativity. So why should being creative be important to you? Those of you who are going to step out of IMB and make careers for yourself in the world. Creativity has become the most desired trait among knowledge workers in the world today because creativity leads to new ideas. New ideas lead to inventions. Inventions can and often do lead to innovations. And that in turn leads to higher productivity and prosperity. So as you step out, you the future leaders of India, you will need to demonstrate creativity in the face of complexity. We were chatting over a cup of tea when uh, Kiran Mazumdar mentioned how the Mangalyaan Mars Orbiter mission happened. A classic example of creativity in the face of complexity. That's the name of the game. You will need to build environments where creativity can flower and flourish. And then, of course, the creative spirit, as the great sages, poets, and artists tell us, connect you to something beautiful and sacred, something beyond your narrow self and experience. It infuses you with a sense of spontaneity and gives you meaning and purpose in life. When someone asked J. Krishnamurti, why do you speak so much to public audiences around the world? He replied by saying, why does a flower bloom? So being creative is terribly important. 
About 15 years ago, I decided to come back to India and start the Agastya Foundation, and I had a dream of building a school for creative leaders in the foothills of the Himalayas. And so I asked the question, what makes a country creative? Is it possible to raise the level of an ocean, the speed limit of creativity of a country? And as I didn't know the answer, I got a lot of smart people around me. Among them was P.K. Iyengar, the former chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, my father, K.V. Raghavan, who had chaired a number of companies, uh, the former principal of the Rishi Valley School, who had worked very closely with J. Krishnamurti, a lot of students from colleges and schools, teachers, educators, and business people. And we came up with a model. We said, look, you, the creative person, are a great observer. You tend to see much more than others do. You tend to hear much more than others do. You tend to feel more deeply than others do. You experience deep awareness, sometimes completely unbiased awareness, which allows new thoughts to germinate and grow. You have the capacity to integrate, assimilate, and associate different strands of information and knowledge apparently unconnected stuff, and find those connections. You tinker, you explore, you experiment, and you have the ability to then apply your knowledge and ideas to produce something of value for yourself, uh, your family, your community, or society in general. So we said these are the sorts of skills that go into creativity, actually rather similar, if not identical, to the discovery skills that are talked about in the book, The Innovator's DNA. But I must add that we came up with this long before the book. So the question next was, can you learn these skills? Can you learn to be more observant, more aware, to connect the dots, to apply things, to produce things of value? And the answer was yes. So Iyengar said, look, Ramji, you're not a scientist, but I'll give you 100 low-cost science experiments. And if I force you to go through those experiments, I guarantee you, you will raise your quality of observation. When you see a candle burn, you'll ask questions. What's actually burning? Or when you see a green leaf, you will know or you'll wonder what makes a leaf green or the sky blue. So you can learn those skills. Now, you may not produce a Ramanujan, but you can create an environment that encourages the Ranis and Rojas of the world, and perhaps the Ramjis of this world, to express themselves and give shape to their ideas fearlessly. But to be creative, you have to be curious, we said. That's the foundational skill. But to be curious, you have to be motivated to be curious. You have to have the passion, the urge to want to find out. There's a story of Chanakya, who was sitting in a village, very despondent, thinking, despite his great intelligence and sagacity, how come we haven't been able to beat our hated enemy, the Nanda King? And he was sitting there pondering his apparent mediocrity when he saw a little boy sit down to have his lunch. And the mother served a plate full of very, very hot rice. The boy was so hungry that he went for it. He scooped a lump of rice from the center of the dish and put it in his mouth and screamed in horror because it scalded his tongue. So his mother was concerned and scolded him and said, you silly boy, don't you realize the rice is hottest at the center? You should start from the edge and work your way slowly to the center. And that was the aha moment that our man was waiting for. He realized, ah, the mistake that Chandragupta and I have been making is trying to attack the Nanda king at the center where he's the strongest. We will start at the edges and work our way to the center. And they did, and the Mauryan Empire started and it came to be known as the rice bowl stratagem. So to be creative, you really have to observe things, simple things, and you must have that urge to be curious. How do you make it happen? And we said, look, hands-on experiential learning perhaps is the way to go. Because we were involved in education, we wanted to spark curiosity, nurture creativity among poor kids and teachers. And we said hands-on experiential learning because Cognitive scientists tell you that the human brain on average retains in its long-term memory no more than 5% of a lecture. 
10% of what you read, 50% of what you see and hear, 70% of what you discuss with someone, 80% of what you personally experience, good or bad, we can all relate to that, and over 90% of what you teach to others. So we said, look, the education system is focused on reading and lectures at best. There's nothing wrong with that, but let's focus on hands-on experiential learning. And hands-on experiential learning also builds your confidence and motivation. And over the years, we kind of realized that perhaps the answer to sparking curiosity and nurturing creativity might lie with a toy like this. So this is called the tippy top. The beauty about it, you leave it there and it sits on its bottom because that's where its center of gravity is. But you spin it, I can't demonstrate it here because it'll fall off. And at a certain speed and depending on the surface you spin it on, it unexpectedly tips over. And you go, ah, because it's unexpected or wow or are. Now that ah is very important. Because in that R, it's rather like when you see something uh, beautiful or arresting or even disturbing, counterintuitive, you go, ah, right? When the mind is awakened, when your curiosity is triggered. So the first and most important element in learning, we said, is the R effect. After you see it tip over, you say, now how did that happen or why does it happen? And you start the process of inquiry and exploration. And if you're lucky and if you're persistent, you have your aha moment, like Sai or Einstein or Ramanujan or Chanakya, or several aha moments. Or you learn something new in a different way, or at the highest level, you have a creative insight. The aha moment is the second most important thing. And the third, of course, is you must have fun doing whatever you're doing, right? And that's the ha-ha element. Because fun and humor remove fear and anxiety. They improve retention and improve performance. So if the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, were the stepping stone for education in the 20th century, I believe the three A's, a, aha, and ha-ha, are the stepping stones for creativity in the 21st century. It's easy. Infuse the three A's in education. In fact, into the way you live and act, and you will find you'll trigger uh, important behavioral shifts. The shift from yes to why, and why not. There's too much yesing in the system. Not enough whying and why noting. The second is the shift from looking to observing. The third is the shift from being very passive to learning to explore. The fourth is the shift from being very textbook bound or internet bound to being more hands on. And finally, the most important shift, the shift from fear to confidence. There's a lot of fear in our system, across schools, institutes, politics, everywhere. People are afraid to speak up and express themselves. I remember years ago visiting a village school and I met the head teacher and asked her, what impact has Agastya had on your school? And she pointed me to a tall girl, Uma, who was standing under a tree. So I went up to Uma and asked Uma, Uma, you've been visiting our campus for several months now. Have we made any difference? Have you seen any change? And I thought she'd say, yes, I'm doing very well in my studies and getting high grades. But she didn't say that. You know what she said? She looked at me and said, sir, I'm not afraid to speak anymore. Now, that was my ah, aha, and ha, ha moment. I realized all of a sudden that the real value of all our hands-on experiential interventions was not so much in improving Uma's grades and unit test scores, although it turned out she was doing very well in her studies. The real value was in the precious opportunity it gave children like Uma to lift their self-belief and confidence, to bring about the shift that psychologists call from learned helplessness to learned optimism. And that's why the program that Sushil referred to where we teach children to teach children, it's really a powerful way of bringing about that shift from learned helplessness 
to learn optimism. So curiosity is a wonderful thing. But numerous occasions, curiosity alone doesn't guarantee action. Confidence alone can lead to bad and sometimes disastrous action when it spills over into arrogance. But curiosity combined with confidence can lead you to strong and positive action. And when you combine curiosity and confidence with humanity, a sense of caring, a relationship with your environment that's deep and caring, you have right or creative action. I've talked about curiosity mostly in terms of the external world, in a, in a scientific sense or in a business sense. But there is equally the power of curiosity into the inner world, the science of the interior, if you like, or adhyatma vidya, as, as we call it in India. The sculptors of old in India would go through long periods of meditation which resulted in uh, spectacular and godly works of art, what Aurobindo called the shift from spirit to form. On the 7th of June, most of you would know this, 1893, when 24-year-old uh, Mohandas Gandhi was thrown out of his first-class compartment in uh, Marisburg, South Africa, he sat humiliated and shivering in a dark waiting room. He thought to himself, I have three choices. I can forget what happened and just continue with my work, move on, humiliated, swallow my pride, or I can go back to India where everyone else looks like I do, or I can stay and fight. Now Gandhi's introspection, when he explored his fears and motives and insecurities, was a defining experience, a very deeply creative experience for him, and a moment, a pivotal moment for the rest of the world. A moment which led to actions from which millions of us have benefited. The coming together of Gandhi's inner questioning and purposeful external action changed the world. So when the two worlds of curiosity, you can play around with the tippy top. Krishnamurti used to talk about the inward, the psyche as the tippy top. When the two worlds of curiosity, the outer and the inner come together, you have a revolutionary mind. A mind that lives in abiding curiosity, confidence in humanity a mind that lives and acts creatively, a mind that acts with purpose and passion. That mind is yours. That mind is yours if you're alive and awake to the power and richness of being curious. If you welcome opportunities with uncertain outcomes and unknown outcomes. If you tinker and explore in whatever you do, not only because you're looking for a result, be it fame or success or money or love or even liberation, but because you absolutely love and enjoy what you're doing, that process of discovery. It's a fundamental difference. Some of the greatest entrepreneurs even, since we are in a business school. The other day I was watching an interview with Elon Musk, the Tesla, Tesla man, Solar City, and SpaceX. And as he was describing his engagement with Tesla and the fact that he'd come very close to a nervous breakdown, somebody asked him about the return on investment. And of course, he had to address that question. And, and then he said, look, I'm not doing this. I have to do it for an ROI, obviously, to make it sustainable. But that's not the driving factor. The driving factor is, I believe the world's going to run out of fossil fuels. And I have to do something about it. The money and the rest of it is a byproduct of it. So it's a subtle shift, and that's what leads to passion-based creativity. 5,100 years ago, a blind king told his chariot here, Dharma Kshetre Kurukshetre Samveta Yuyutsavaha Mamakaha Pandavaschaiva Kimma Kurvata Sanjaya Kimma Kurvata Sanjaya O Sanjay on the holy battlefield of Kurukshetra, Tell me what my sons, the Kurus, and the sons of Pandu are doing. Now, I would submit that you, we, are at the crossroads of a similar make or break decision. You have a great responsibility. We talked about a new government, the potential that India has. You can't eat potential. 
you have a great responsibility. Like never before in our history, what you choose to do when you step out of this institute will have a profound effect on the rest of the world. Because you are the world. Do you want to build a creative India? An India that's full of ideas, an India that innovates, an India that invents, an India that creates new models of learning, of business, social entrepreneurship, of politics, of sustainable and spiritual living? Or do you want to copy what someone else says or does? So as you step out of the IIM Bangalore and pursue your careers, elevate your vision. Go where no one's gone before. Inspire yourself through your unique mission and inspire your colleagues and friends and families as well. Sing and dance or create environments where singers and dancers like Rani and Roja and a young Ramanujan can flourish. Find a tippy top and live the three A's, ah, aha, and ha-ha. Thank you very much.